the past week. Um, so yeah, I do appreciate the committee taking the time to discuss my case two weeks ago, uh, which I had an opportunity to view on YouTube. So thanks whoever put that up. Uh, by now, some of you may have reviewed Chief Rosser's letter, which summarized the actions of his officers on June 14th. The tactics and procedures in kinetic situations are part of an ongoing dialogue we need to continue with the subcommittee, with our neighbors and across the nation. Ferguson is once again simmering with violence and protest because that community understands that police sometimes take for granted the privilege of force we've granted them. Now, Chief Rosser and I had an opportunity to discuss these issues one-on-one -on -one yesterday. I felt it was helpful and constructive, and I'll share some of my remarks and concerns with you that I shared with him. In a summary of my incident um, that was released on August 7th, Chief Rosser essentially produced a circular justification. That the procedures were correct because that's what the book says. And if the book says it's right, then the officers were right. I expected that, and I'd agree that they acted according to regulation. Whether the book itself needs rewriting is a question I hope Chief Rosser and other leaders, including this committee, will answer in the coming weeks and months. That is a separate issue from what I hope to address today with you, which is the conduct of Fairfax County police officials after the raid, as I try to gather information about what happened. The conduct I encountered is emblematic of an opaque culture in Fairfax County, with such a concerning recent history that the communications subcommittee found there to be a, quote, crisis of confidence, end quote. As I made clear in my op-ed, my chief complaint, and subsequently in this investigation, launched by Chief Rossler, is how the officers failed to reasonably exhaust all opportunities to gather information before raiding the bedroom with guns drawn and leveled at me. I'll have to take the 911 caller and officers at, the world, at their word when they said they tried to contact management. But there is one problematic detail made clear to the investigator when I participated in the probe that did not find its way into the chief's summary. The responding officer's fact gathering of security team is one point of contention. On page four of the summary, the chief says, quote, when the first officer arrived at the security gate to obtain information about the model apartment from the security guard on duty, the guard did not have information to convey. Also on page one of the findings, quote, the first arriving officer asked the security officer about the call for service they are dispatched to and the security guard advised they were unaware of any events at the location the officers were dispatched to. And I believe uh, this can be talked about um, the, the TikTok, what happened at the booth. The first line supervisor who, uh, uh, the first line supervisor who received the initial complaint did not ask the security guard if this was the case during his investigation, but I did. In fact, I asked the security company's corporate office to talk to the guard and ask them what between the guard, what was said between the guard and the responding police officers during their arrival, and if there were any words exchanged at all. A representative from the security company told me precisely the opposite of what was found in Chief Rossell's report. The officers only asked the guard uh, which building the 911 caller had identified, and then they went in. That's it. No questions, no fact gathering. I talked to the security guard later myself that night on June 19th, and she stands by that statement. When I presented this to the supervisor who conducted that first initial investigation, he dismissed it and refused to look into the possibility that the responding police officers had provided false information to them and their actions that morning. Can I hit the tape, please? First uh, audio you're going to hear on this call is a conversation I had with uh, the security guard um, who received the officers that day. So the questions I had about them is like, why didn't they try to find out more information about? So, uh, yeah, so my question is, like, how, what happened when they came through? Sure, absolutely. Uh, our duty is to just let them in, see how I just have the officer in, and then yeah. I ask questions. If they don't give us any answers, it's an officer, they can't go behind me. Uh, we just let them in. We don't ask them questions. They don't involve us. They don't ask any questions. They don't know anything. I didn't know anything about a transfer, a mold, or anything. They yeah. They don't tell us anything. It's a bottom of the And that's what I, my problem with management is they didn't tell anybody. They didn't tell security. They didn't tell like anyone on the floor that this was happening. Like they fucked up first, right? Yeah, that's right. So, but my question with the cops is like, what happened here? Listen, we just let them in. Let's let them in. Did you like? Did you have any conversations no. with them or anything? Mm -hmm. Just like the kids. They came in. They said, "Where's building one?" We found them and that's it. So they went from. Like, they said, "Where's building one?" You pointed. And, that's it. and they went. We don't have any we can't question. We can't hold them. Yeah. The second clip you're hearing in a few seconds is a discussion I had after this conversation uh, with one of the principal uh, supervisors uh, that has familiarity with the case. When I asked him about this conversation. So, 
is out there reported to you that they have a suspicion of the gate? When I asked, the first officer to respond told me that she was the first one there. She drove to the security booth. They said, good morning. She said, hey, we got a call about an off on the street. Is there anything up here? They said, no, I haven't heard anything. She was, okay, can I get the key to the building, whatever it was? And they said, sure, here you go. Okay. Um, when you conducted your follow-up, did you discuss any of the security or just the officer? No, I had no reason to discuss any of the security. Okay. Uh, I spoke to the security company, uh, and their position is that there was no question that happened at the gate. That they asked where one building was, because the, there's three towers. They asked where the first one was, they pointed out, and then they went. There's no discussion about any case that happened. I told you there was no discussion. It was a. There was no question at all. It was okay, which well, one is the building, and then they went in. It's a so, mundane detail, so maybe they forgot, or maybe they just not remembering, because really it was not a serious call. Yeah. It wasn't a serious call. Uh, not for the. It, they were not running in lights and sirens saying, give me a key, give me a key. So it probably happens every day with the security office. Okay. Do you see where I'm going, though? It's like, no, I don't it's, see where you're going with this. And I have looked into your complaint, and your complaint is finished. Yeah. We're done with it. It's been documented. Unless there's something new that, some sort of revelation that you're just now bringing up. It's done. Well, There's nothing um, further that's going to happen. That's what I'm trying to say here. And I mean, you could go back and ask the officers to be. I'm not clear. going to go back and ask the officers. To be clear this time because no, there is, there's inconsistency We're done. with your story. We're done. Okay. The official position for them is that this discussion didn't happen. Now, after the fact that you. It doesn't matter if it happened or not. I mean, it's in, a, in a police report, I guess it does. No, it does you guys not. Are, for this particular case, the complaint is how the officers handled. With the guns out and lack of information gathering. Yeah. None of that is important as far as the work. They follow rules and regulations, general orders to the T. I mean, that's right. They don't really do anything wrong. And I told you that the last time. Could they gather information? Yes. Are they required to? No. They're not required. So it doesn't matter whatsoever what was said or not said in security. It does if they gave you a false report. Doesn't no, it? No, it does not. If they, Who gave me a false report? The officer said they, they asked questions about the case. But they, they didn't, didn't ask questions about the case. You need to hear what I'm saying, not what you want to hear. Okay? What I'm saying is, if there was some sort of conversation there, it consisted of, hey, have you gotten any calls up here about anything? No, I haven't. Okay, can I have the key? Sure, let's go. That part is important, right? Not as far as I'm concerned, it's not, no. So I had, um, I've handed over these files and I've told everything I told you uh, during the open investigation. Uh, it was all conveyed to the lead investigator, the probe. Uh, the recordings you just heard, unredacted, so there is even more uh, from the security guard that I handed over. Um, but everything is entirely missing from the summary that was released and posted online on the 7th. Not a word of that was mentioned at all, even though it was part of the investigation. And actually, for 90 minutes when I talked to the investigator, during my statement, this was the bulk of my complaint, not the tactics and procedures of the 10 minutes during the raid, but this conversation and the aftermath, all of which did not make it into the report. But there is something even more disturbing to come from this investigation. And if you were here at the last meeting, you heard it. Uh, Major Mike Klein over here, uh, the head of internal affairs, answered a few questions about the case to the best of his knowledge. But halfway through, he began to speculate about things that weren't true. When he sought to explain why he didn't respond to initial commands at the door, he said, quote, it can be well inferred, and our investigation indicates that he had spent the night before drinking rather heavily, end quote. This is untrue and pure conjecture. By all accounts, the officer said I was cooperative and compliant, and nothing would have indicated that I was inebriated. I know that for a fact. After Major Klein made this comment, I asked the investigator why his boss would say something so baseless and even more outrageous in public during an open investigation. He told me he thought that I spent, uh, he told me that I, how I spent the night before was an irrelevant detail, and he didn't even bring it up during my statement. We didn't talk about this during my, uh, my comment once to him in 90 minutes. Major Klein's false statement about me is classic victim blaming. We're justified to enter and use force because he was too drunk to answer. It lets the officers off the hook for escalating a mistaken call, and it diminishes my good standing. We see this constantly with the police and the media. He's no angel, they say, in defense of excessive force. As a private citizen, this is pretty troubling. 
As a veteran, this is alarming. Major Klein made it to point to reference my service in Iraq several times before this remark. And whether consciously or not, he sees on the harmful trope of the damaged, drunk, and disheveled war veteran that my community I sought to amend in the wake of Vietnam. It is an ugly and damaging stereotype prevalent in our culture, and it is following my brothers and sisters as they come off the battlefield and return home. From university classrooms to the office water cooler, we have to constantly push back against misconceptions about post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, suicide, alcohol, alcoholism, and unemployment. We change beliefs by being thoughtful, engaged, and successful citizens. We win through hard work. We lose when we are marginalized and distorted, uh, as the major distorted me. When I spoke to Chief Rossler yesterday, he ensured me that Major Klein's remarks are now under investigation for potential violations of both the ethics and the law. So I expect to hear the results soon and I will share them with you. Now both of these issues, an example of information gathering that may not exist, and an inflammatory untrue remark said by Major Klein, are data points in a culture that does not appear to put a high priority on accountability, professionalism, or transparency. This is, after all, a committee that urges judicious use of force. So I'll end on why this is so vital to get right, and what the linger effects are of the raid that has been for me, even if I came out right, at least physically. It's been nearly two months since the raid, and only recently have I been able to sleep the whole night without waking up at the smallest noise and checking my lock on the door. On one night, I woke up four times, my heart racing. The first thought is always, they're back. Based on his agreement with the findings of the Communications Subcommittee, along with the findings of the Police Executive Research Forum, Chief Rossler appears to be engaged. But if my experience with several of his subordinates is any indication, he has a long way to go. Change will take time, but we must continue to have a constructive dialogue. Our citizens must not break faith with the police. There is too much at stake to, re to remain complacent, and the safety of everyone, citizens and police both, hang in the balance. I know Fairfax County has the opportunity to lead our nation uh, and the state in transformation. And so they have an opportunity to seize it. That's all. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? 